congratulations on a really great entry, Klaus. Uh, I just feel like um, things could have gone on a little bit longer. I, I think there was one more section to go at the level that you were at that you could have contributed. But all the same, just really fun, uh, really cinematic scoring, um, you know, just really um real exciting to look at and very fun very funny you know in a lot of ways let's talk about balance because that really is still a little bit of a of a problem here and you know there are certain things that are just not going to work but we'll we'll take it section by section okay um rather than me pointing out a, a bunch of things globally okay so so let's start off with the Celeste part right in here. This is just not going to come through. Now, if you were mixing this, like if this were a, um, a film score, you could get away with that. But this is just not going to sound very loud at all. And the harp right in here is, you know, the sound set is just not telling you the correct amount of force that the harp is going to have right in here. Even with this light scoring, the harp is going to get buried a bit. The other thing to think about too is that you have this this E being plucked um, at eighth note intervals constantly throughout this, and basically what is going to happen is that you're going to get stomping. All right, so um, let me just quickly take a look here. I'm looking at my own uh, 100 orchestration tips. Um, hang on, that's 100 more orchestration tips. <laughs> Here we go. Just to give you the right... Okay, so uh, tip 69 in 100 orchestration tips, the original book, talks about stomping. And this is an example. So the notes are being played so quickly that the uh, when the next finger comes to touch the same string to repeat the plucking, the vibration of the string will buzz against the fingertip as it touches the string. So you sort of get this kind of sound, right? So the way to avoid that is to have enharmonic equivalents, right? So you would have you would be going back and forth between E natural and F flat. Right, so you get the same enharmonic note, and that would, that, what that means is that means that there's less, um, there's less frequent that each string is being plucked. Right, so you would get away with it. Now here, I would say just go to octaves, right here, and um, you could actually do, you could have alternating octaves on either side of the of uh, with with either hand, right, so that the, um, the player's right hand would be playing F flat up here and the, like the their their thumb would be playing F flat and then their ring finger would be playing F flat down here and then alternating with E with the left hand would be the way to do this okay so I mean this is all possible but I mean is that really the right sound that you want so I mean it does have this nice sense of motion and, and everything else but you know does it Will it really be heard in a concert stage? Not that much. So is it like worth all of the fuss? Now here you've got this kind of strange thing going on here. You say first desk, violas, first desk, second violins, and so on. And then you have got this very, very delicate tissue here um, with them playing against like English horn, flutes, Clarinets. I mean, you're, you're trying to be really, just really keep it soft because of, I guess, because of the lower harp and celesta. But I just feel that maybe that's just a little too fussy. It's going to be very a very thin sound. Do you know what I mean? And you're building towards something um, right in here. It's kind of strange that you go piano to mezzo forte crescendo. And then here you're going piano to mezzo forte crescendo here is the peak of the phrase. Right, and then it's just like the dynamics kind of don't really line up together, even though they're working together. Do you know what I mean? So that means that the insides of the phrases are going to be weak or possibly smothered by other instruments that are stronger. Right, like these, like the oboes and the English horn are going to overwhelm, even though this is tutti, right, starting from piano. So 
there's just a bunch of different balance questions right in here. All right, so that we're gonna work out some of them with you. All right, now the other thing is that you've got this strange string thing happening here where you have measured tremolo, but you have slurs, right? So that doesn't really mean anything. Measured tremolo, you know, you're going da 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 right? So that, like, I mean, unless you were thinking that this would all be under one bow going the same direction, in which case I would really recommend scoring it a different way, like scoring it as, like, maybe... Um, if you really had to have this all slurred together, which it just really isn't isn't a very good technique for the, I mean, it isn't a very comfortable technique or natural technique for the for the string player, uh, then you would have to write out every single note and then have a bow over it and then like maybe whatever articulation, like say mezzo staccato, so you'd have bowed uh, staccato with a, with a slur over it or or whatever, but it's just it just doesn't really make a whole lot of sense with the way that you are slurring these things, right? So that's that's not the way it works. You either are repeating the note or you have a slur over it because it is being bowed together. All right. Um, so, and here you say divisi first desk. So that means that there's only one player on this note and one player on that note, all right? So it's just a little strange. Maybe just throw away all the first desk stuff and, you know, just go with a regular old string section and just mark them pianissimo, all right? And it's kind of strange, you come in here forcefully, mezzo forte, here mezzo forte on the pizzicato. Yeah, and then it backs off to piano when these, yeah, just the, yeah, the dynamics are just not making sense to me here. Um, but I like da 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 da. What if you just started piano, right? So that you, you're starting in the world of color that is soft, right, and radiant. Or if you just were were just you know f simplice, right? And the uh, you know, but starting mezzo forte, everything mezzo forte, just like mezzo forte is not a default dynamic from which you should start and finish, right? Because it is it is the the color of the instruments is so, somewhat dull. The the you know they're it's just kind of warm, right? It's a little strong. And, and it's not only just kind of unimpressive in terms of force, but it's also unimpressive in terms of instrument color. That is the, really the main thing I, that I keep repeating in these evaluations. Mezzo forte and mezzo piano have sort of dull instrument colors. They're grayish. They're intended to stay out of the way while other instruments are more prominent in terms of, of soft or loud dynamics, right? Okay, so to just I would just strongly recommend just try to be as simple as possible with your dynamics as a default, either piano or forte, right? And then from there you can become more subtle. But like in a in a basic, you know, in scoring this kind of music, this sort of tonal music uh, that is that has its roots in impressionism and everything else. It's just better to, you know, to use more traditional, uh, traditional dynamic principles rather than getting lost in fussy little dynamics like, you know, that really don't increase very much or decrease very much or don't really go anywhere. OK, and that will actually help this approach of scoring that you've got way, way better. You'll be, really be able to to vary things much better. So, you know, if you really, if you look at all of the things that you're doing here, it is largely mezzo forte, right? You start mezzo forte, you end this mezzo forte, there's mezzo forte there, forte, mezzo forte, and so on, right? So there's very little dynamic variation. It's just the colors that you're using to vary things with. So I would say just really try to back off from that. Um, you know, it, it it's, it's kind of the, the flip side of a piece I, of, a, of an entry that I evaluated a little bit before this that were, you know, the, the first uh, quite a few bars went by with everything at very soft dynamics, right? So, so this is the same thing. You want to have more flux between parts, right? And frankly, you know, forte to mezzo forte and back is really not much of a dynamic change, right? Piano to mezzo forte is a beautiful dynamic change, but then again, it's very mixed in like what is standing out and what's coming out and what's going 
going back and so on, and that, which just means that certain things are going to get buried rather than coming and going because of the relative weaknesses and strengths of the other instruments around them, right? Okay. So other than that, <laughs> I mean, discussing all of this stuff, it's actually fairly nicely orchestrated in this, you know, these first eight bars. Um, so uh, English horn and uh, flute, first flute together, ba da da dum. That's pretty nice. See, now this will work if the English horn is marked piano and the flute is marked mezzo forte, right? So that's that's a, right now the way that this is. The English horn is so strong compared to the flute in its lower and middle register that it will just basically obliterate it, right? But it can be a nice balanced timbre if you just really back off on the English horn. Now here we have octaves da 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 dum, and this is kind of cool too. It has a nice kind of a uh, organ-like sound, and then we start to build ba da boom ba da boom ba ba boom. There's kind of an absence here of like there's slurs here where you don't need them in the strings, like you know you don't slur on measured staccato, right? There's just no need to do that, and it just continues on and on. So I mean, I'm just wondering what what is the how do you think that measured stic measured sorry measured staccato measured tremolo how do you think measured tremolo could be slurred right how could these notes smoothly connect together in one bow if the bow is going back and forth and going da 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 right i don't understand that where you know how that um how that sort of came to be now here um there is kind of a lack of slurring in the in the winds, right? And and I feel like in here there is a slur, but I mean da da so do you really want da or do you want da 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 or da da or da da There are a bunch of different ways of doing this, but like the main thing is do you want to take away emphasis from the downbeat, right? Da, there's no emphasis of tonguing or articulation on the downbeat anymore because their slur goes across. But if you put, if you break the slur right here, da, da, right? We have some meaning in the phrase. Right here we have more slurring across the, across the downbeat and so on. So just, you know, watch out for that stuff because it just really makes things feel like there's no, you know, there's no pulse to the, especially to the melody, like melodies have got to have pulses to them as well. They have to, sometimes they have to agree with the downbeat in order to convey meaning to the phrase. Okay, so this is neat, bringing in the brass, but you have to understand that the brass here will be very loud compared to everything else. And you can hear it in the mock-up, right? It just stands right out. Here's another thing, like, um, da -da -de -da -dum, ba -da -da -dum. right in here we have the horns just pushing through the texture and like flaring out and then going right back again. If you really want this to be like an effect, like a flare coming, you know, going, you know, just standing out of the music just for a second, then mark the end points piano, not mezzo forte, okay? And also don't leave out this because this will just keep blaring. These trumpets will keep blaring at forte. So yeah, so this needs to be more controlled in here cool just you know tuba and rolled timpani that's very very cool with a um, double bass at the bottom that's that's a really neat combination okay um, now we get to bump 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 and this is really this is we're starting to get into some very cool territory here bassoons and English sorry clarinets I meant to say uh, bassoons and clarinets uh, mezzo staccato with pizzicato and harp, uh, rolled harp, with trilled oboe family instruments. Okay, now, once again, my pet peeve, and I think you've actually heard this one before, Klaus, so you need to stop doing this, okay? You don't need an upward roll line on harp, celesta, keyboards, whatever. Don't use an upward arrow roll line. Just use a standard roll line. Unless you are rolling down before you're rolling up, right? 
So the rolling down line, like I used in my arrangement, uh, that is opposite of the usual direction, right? So you use the upward roll line to correct it, just to say, okay, now we're going upward rolls. And then after that, it can just all be normal standard rolls. The problem with using the upward roll line is that it is like, um, you know, it, it's, it's overdoing the instructions. Okay, it's like it's it's like putting, you know, it's like putting hand um, uh, safety wheels on, you know, on a racing bicycle. The harpist will understand this passage. Let's see, I'm going to get the keypad. So the harpist will understand this passage to mean the same thing with just standard roll marks, right? But when you add the upward roll marks the harpist will probably stop and say, wait, where was the downward roll mark? Did I miss that? And they'll look at the part and then they'll think, oh, right. Person's just being literal, right? And, and you don't want any wasted time in, in rehearsal or study of your score or anything like that. So please, everybody, I wrote a tip about this. Please don't use upward roll marks unless you are also using downward roll marks and you need to distinguish between the two. They're just not necessary, okay? Okay. All right, bum, 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 and then bum, bum. I like all this stuff right in here. This tuba responding timpani, little loud, right? And then, um, then here, like you keep your response strong, right? Except here you've got uh, col legno. So, so here's, okay, so col legno, and then you go, so col legno battuto, and then they're gonna flip their bow over really quickly and play Ordinario. Now, sometimes with Colegno Battuto, I'm noticing that some players will use the side of the bow rather than the back of the bow. And that way they get a little bit of horsehair in there and it's louder for the player. And um, and and the, the composer might hear and say, oh yeah, that's the, that's the effect I want. That's nice and loud. But the honest truth is that actual Colegno Battuto is really soft. It's a soft effect. So if everybody's going to continue to play mezzo forte, you really are not going to hear this. And, you know, uh, I really love Note Performer, and I think it's great the way that they supply more realistic uh, mock-up sounds that are, you know, realistic in a pinch, not realistic in a perfected way. And, and, and all that, but they are still fooling you. That is not as loud, the, that is not how loud Colegno Battuto is going to be. And what's more, you don't want to market piano if you want it to compete with everything else that's going on, right? So if this is mezzo forte in the harps and you got piano pizzicato here and everybody else is sort of playing mezzo forte-ish, right? That was the last dynamic that you assigned here, right? And here we are playing mezzo forte in these winds and we've got a little bit of triangle too. You want to hear this, this Colegno Battuto, you market forte. Okay, or you just put in pizzicato and, you know, don't expect, you know, you could put in pizzicato and just put in like a, like a wood block or, or some other kind of knocking kind of a sound in your percussion. All right. All right. Then we get to here and it's really kind of the same thing again. You know, it's sort of pluck, 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 you know, just kind of higher and you got your little piccolo trill at the top. All right. So very cheery, sort of bird-like. Ha ha. Lily's going out, you know. She's going out to the lake, or she's going out to the pond, or, you know, she's going out in nature, uh, in, out in the garden. Yeah, so I would say, if you're going to change this part right in here, you know, maybe a little bit more variety, especially in the strings, and then the reaction, change what the reaction is, okay? Now, did you notice here, ritardando, and you've got this... Um, You've got these measured tremolos. Now you have all of your measured tremolos in here. Um, the this kind of measured tremolo, you have them marked as sixteenth notes. I think you mean thirty-second notes. Did you notice how this really slows down? You can really kind of hear each individual note as you get to the end of the ritardando, right? And if you want to avoid that, and like and like here, we just have, you know, just have eighth notes going back and forth twice. See, this should be written out as all of the notes rather than saving the time here uh, by putting, that's just, it's just, yeah. Right in here, this should have all been written out as separate notes rather than having a, having a measured tremolo line. 
save this um, measured tremolo beam, like the single beam, for when you're in cut time and the music is going very, very fast. Then it really means something. Here in this sort of medium fast music, it, it which isn't in cut time, it doesn't really make that huge of a difference. Okay. Okay, and then uh, bum, 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 bum. I thought this was actually pretty original. Okay, so you just like you've got the strings way below and you've got uh, horns and bassoons, a little bit of clarinet on top, uh, or in the middle, I should say. And you've got, you know, like da 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 dum, and then bum bum bum. I, yeah, this is very, very fun with the, uh, with the heavy brass doing their little fanfare. It's very fun. And then a little, little bit of um, measured tremolo reaction. Once again, I feel this is a triple beam. This should be triple beam rather than a double beam. Okay. And everybody gets all excited then. Um, Dun, 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 dun. Okay, so all right. So what what gets me a little bit here is the upward motion. I think right in here, this takes away from the following upward motion. You know that this kind of upsweep. Right. Okay. And this, but this was very very cool. This this is once again a very cinematic technique right in here. Lock and spiel, harp. I think this should be an octave higher. Uh, flutes and so on. And then, uh, yeah, and then all of this sort of very, once again, very avian, very bird-like kind of stuff. And this was neat too, the little glissando. Good marking here, like you're, I think um, you, if you're going to do this, if you're going to mark the, that it's a different bowing, okay, first thing is you don't need the down bow, you, excuse me, you don't need the down bow mark. You do not need the slur mark. Just have, the, just assume that it's going to be down bow, and then put the up bow mark at the end. Okay, that's how to do that. Because the slur is saying something different from the change in bow, right? It's like either one or the other. The slur says this is all one bow. The up bow mark says this isn't all one bow, right? So the half note is already telling the player that the bowing is going to last this long. So you don't need the slur if you're going to change bows, right? So that's the thing. So and you don't even need the down bow because everybody knows that's a down bow. So just have you know get rid of this, get rid of the slur, and then just put the um, up bow at the end, and that tells the player, oh yeah, right. And then they might they might end up like deciding to have the up bow at the beginning and then a down bow at the end so that they can fade off a little bit more naturally. Okay, and then this will also be down bow, right? And then this will be up bow. That's what I would probably do. Anyway, um, but yeah, just nice little effects, a little bit of glockenspiel. Uh, and, you know, and, and, you know, a sort of a change in the way that it, the way that the piano is scored versus the, um, versus the orchestra part. You know, da 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 da. Then ba da da bum, ba da da bum, bum bum. That's all very cool. So here you have this beautiful explosion of color here. The um, the upper winds are basically doing the same thing as harp and celesta at the same pitch. And then we've got some of those same voices being doubled in the upper winds. And you know, little, little flighty uh, bird-like playing once again from Piccolo. It can get to be a little bit much, right? I mean, I, I, obviously, with this arrangement, you are only scoring a few limited bars, so it, it doesn't wear out its welcome. But if you were to do the entire piece, I would say just just limit what you're doing here on piccolo. It, it's sort of distracting, anyways, from this from these uh, lovely phrases in here. Now, here I would say this is not really the most idiomatic kind of harp scoring. You know what I mean? It's just very involved. Like the, you know, it, 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 I mean, it's playable, but it's just really, you know, it's just kind of fiddly. It's really more of a piano kind of a part. I'm just kind of wondering if there is a way of simplifying this. Like maybe what if the harp played this upper line in octaves and the celesta played this lower line in octaves? 
you know, would, I think you, I think that idea would come through much clearer, and the players would be much happier about it. I mean, this will come through fine on Celesta, but it's 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 scored pretty low on Celesta, and the um, you know, and it'll it will kind of just get absorbed into the sound of everything else going on there. So those are just a few caveats for you, but you know, first flute is great here. The uh, English horn scoring is really, really good. It's an excellent combination. The oboe part in the middle is great. My question is, why even bother to have the first flute here on this second voice? Why not ah two flutes right in here? You need the strength there. You don't need the first, or sorry, you don't need the second flute to get buried by the oboes, right? So right in here, that's just, that's completely unnecessary. The, the, the second flute scored where it is, okay? Um, but yeah, other little things, the uh, glockenspiel supporting the piccolo, that's very, very cool. The, um, <clears throat> but the melody right in here, I feel just really kind of, you know, da-da-da-dum, da-da-dum-bum. Here, it, I just don't know if it, you know, I mean, would it be possible to score the, the first few notes, um, like, these first three notes, an octave higher in clarinets, right? And then drop down to the F sharp. Maybe might might be a better way to go there. Okay, but I mean it's a really cool idea. It distracts from the original and the and you know the original idea and the which is not as em emphasized quite enough, right? And once again we've got um <clears throat> semi quaver finger tremolo when I think you really mean um, you really mean uh, like a kind of unmeasured tremolo between the, you know, just kind of a fluttering sound between the two pitches. If you are doing this kind of stuff, you know, like measured tremolo, uh, tremolo on the stem, tremolo between the stems, it's really good to just write out, you know, in here, like you have, I mean, it, it is so often, Klaus, that the um, that composers accidentally use two beams when they mean three beams especially when the music feels like that's what you want like right here right there right there so it's really better to just write out the first set like if you don't mean if you you know if you mean measured tremolo specifically between 16th notes I would say write out the first set and then from there on go on with your tremolo and then like the players will really really get it but there are certain things in here like these single beam this would all totally be written out like I said before okay <clears throat> bum, 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 bum. so let's go on dun, 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 dun. all right um, horns clarinets coming in I feel that there should be some diminuendo here at the end of the horns so that they tie in way better to the end of the, you know, to this tail end phrase here, right? And there could have been a little bit more support rather than just a little bit of harp. I just, I felt this was a little weak right here at the end um, with just the bassoons and the clarinets. I think that there could have been a little bit more going on in the strings maybe. Now, da 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 bum bum resol resolution. So the resolution is a little is a little barren because there's no support from you know it's just it's just a little bit of trombone and some horn and you know one little note right there in the end from bassoons and contrabassoon. All right, so it's a little barren and that you know it just kind of almost like you're leaving it to. A little brass band to sort of finish off this really ambitious idea, right? Um, and and also just kind of like the the dynamic was really strange right in here. I think that there are some signs here that this was dropped in to Sibelius or or exported to Sibelius from from a, a MIDI tracks. And the that's that's something that this is something that you get with MIDI tracks that is like a dotted um, dotted rests rather than just like a a whole rest you know like this right which changes the resolution or the justification of the score 
So yeah, so it just has signs that it was exported from MIDI, and also like there are these, um, these little, all this kind of MIDI controller kind of text right in here, which is telling your, uh, telling your notes to do certain things, and which in this case I feel is to play very softly, like in the in the mock-up, I could barely hear the strings right in here. And yeah, so I, I just felt that that kind of weakened it, weakened the playback. And then, uh, ba -da -da -ba, and then this comes in softly afterwards. I just feel it, yeah, it, it, it loses some energy here. Maybe it could have been stronger to write about here and then let go. And then there's just a little bit of resolution at the end. Uh, but I mean, it feels that the resolution could have been supported a little bit more strongly, maybe maybe just a just a little bit of color in the strings or something else. Okay. All right. So those are all of my picky little thoughts about this. And you know, I just really did pick it apart and everything else. That is, and you know, my my very detailed uh, analysis of your score does not mean that it was lacking in any way. It just kind of needs to needs to be worked through a bit, right? A really great imagination was brought to this, and like, and you are starting to get better and better craft. The more I see your um, your entries to these challenges, and just really, you know, fascinating ideas. A lot of these, a lot of the approaches that you used here could be used in any kind of score any kind of very colorful, dramatic score for a film. And, and I, I can't help thinking that you have a lot to say about orchestration and you have a lot of really great insights of your own. And if you could please possibly share those with the other, especially with the other people who submitted this level of score, you know, the, the people whose scores I'm releasing today, uh, you know, um, like Eddie Gonzalez and John Hyde and and everybody else who um, who is in this same dotted semi brev level. I think you just would have a lot. You know, you could have some really good advice for them, or even just like some. You know, if if they've done one or two things that you really enjoyed, just let them know. Okay, it just really would mean a lot to me too. Okay, so thanks once again for submitting a great score to the challenge to these yearly challenges and for your support on patreon it's really appreciated um you know you're just such a strong member of this community it's i um, you know, your your presence is is very much appreciated and and you know and it's great to have you with us okay so on to my next evaluation here at the dotted semi-brev level <laughs>